Today's show is brought to you by locally owned and operated Highland Rem Speedway. Highland Rem Speedway is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year with great short track door-to-door -door stop car racing in a safe, family-friendly atmosphere. Visit their website at highlandrim.com. Jeff Meeks and Chris Austin invite you to watch your favorite sports event at the Batter's Box at 43 Hermitage Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. The Batter's Box offers shuttle service to all Titans home games. It's a great place for friends to gather for the game and after the game. So check out the Batter's Box Bar and Grill and thanks again for sponsoring the show. It's a roller coaster on Pit Pass this week. Longtime announcer and behind the scenes guy Malcolm West joins us for a look at being on the road and behind the mic. And we pay special tribute to the man who brought late model stock cars to Nashville, Larry Woody, joins me next on Pit Pass. From the family grocery hauler to fire breathing racing engines, the one name you need to know is USA Motor and Machine, located at 51 Cleveland Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. Give them a call at 615-726-3725 or at usamotorandmachine.com. All on Cooper CPAs, located in the heart of East Nashville, offer a wide variety of tax services for individuals and businesses. Contact them at 615-257-0646 and visit their website, allcooper.com, for a full list of services. Microcasting for your city. Talk Talkopolis. Well, welcome in, everybody, to Pit Pass. I'm Joe Williams, along with... My idol, Larry Woody, mm -hmm. on the far end. Mr. Mm -hmm. Woody, good morning. Joseph. Do we need to talk about the guy in the middle? You've been around this guy a while, hadn't you? Go ahead and introduce him, though. I was going to say, with us today, our special <laughs> guest, Malcolm West. And, and I don't know exactly how many of the titles and things that he's done that I want to put in there. Let's, let's put it this way. Uh, this is a special day for me because, partner, we've been up and down the road a few times. Gosh, we have, and I feel like Malcolm in the middle. Sorry, I had to go there. <laughs> you stole my line. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but we have. We've had a lot of fun, and, and all of us worked everywhere together and saw a lot of good racing, a lot of great stories that Larry could write three more books mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. uh, no. Got to wait the sta for the statute of limitations. Exactly. Right? We've got to wait a couple more years. <laughs> Malcolm, as an announcer, how far back do you and Joe go? How, how, how long have you all been sharing broadcast booths at racetracks around not just here, but around the country. 92? Yeah, when I was a baby, I would go to the races and see Joe Williams. I said, go. I want to be just like him. A long time ago, the dream of every Kentucky announcer was to announce at the fairgrounds in Nashville. And my hero was Joe Williams. And I was so countryfied when I got down there and terrified. I didn't even know how to use a headset. I had to ask a Metro police officer how to, because you were talking to me on the radio and I didn't know how to work it. We didn't have those things in Kentucky, but it's been a great relationship. We've had a lot of fun, a lot of great stories. You just talked loud when you called racing in Kentucky. Hey, Joe, you just stood we did. Up yeah, we just threw notes at, uh, up and pigeons. And, and you're from Kentucky, a little background. Malcolm. Muhlenberg County, home yeah. of the Everly Brothers. That's about the only thing. And we're, we're south of Owensboro, Kentucky, which is a home of all the NASCAR greats, the Waltrips, the Mayfields, and, well, not so great, and the Greens. <laughs> And it's it's just racing country. And, and you grew up in, in that that area, in that era, didn't you? I did. I was uh, Clarence Brewer Sr. owned a dirt track, and I was yeah. 13 years old. I became a gopher. And I would take the lineups down to the flagman. And yeah. then, of course, Clarence Brewer Sr.'s son, Jr., ended up fast-forwarding in the uh, Bush Series with two teams and almost won yeah. a championship. So it's, it's been Bru a Bruco Brucco Motorsports. Bruco Motorsports. Yeah. We had Casey Atwood brought them their first win in Milwaukee, uh, yeah. bumped out Owensboro's Jeff Green. Yep. Uh, for the win at Milwaukee, and so he brought him. Uh, of course, we have a lot of connections there, and of course, Casey at the fairgrounds and so forth. And right now, he's just fishing and counting his money, which is nothing wrong with that. One of the first things you did was uh, was help score races in, in a rather unique way. Typically, scoring, especially at a weekly track, is done by what they call line scoring, and it's just there's somebody uh, on a, on a sheet, somebody's calling, and somebody else is writing down the numbers as they cross the start finish line. You guys didn't even go that far. Well, NASCAR today has uh, things on a car, transponders oh, yeah. on a car, and all computerized. Well, back then, we had dominoes, like you play dominoes <laughs> with. And we would put a piece of masking tape on this domino. And on this domino, we put the car numbers they came in and registered in. And when the cars would get out on the racetrack, we would put them in front of us uh, two by two as they were lined up on the racetrack. And that's how we kept up with the cars. As they passed each other, we'd move the dominoes. And this is a true story. High tech. High tech. High tech. Yeah. And we actually had one of the dominoes fall off the table one time. And one of the cars wrecked out there. The same car wrecked out on the racetrack. So it was a little eerie, kind of like a Ouija board. It's kind of creepy. A little, a little voodoo there. A little voodoo there, but it worked. Kind of creepy. Larry, you've uh, 
you've seen a lot of announcers in a lot of places. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I got to be, and, and I'm biased. I'm gonna be, be up front. This, this is this is my basically brother from another mother. <laughs> but uh, he's always called call me the other word before too. But that's another. <laughs> well, story. that's another story. <laughs> I have never been around a racetrack announcer who could work a crowd like this guy. And, and quickly, before we get into this story, I've never seen two guys who have a better rapport than Joe Williams <laughs> and Malcolm West. You guys, there, there's a chemistry there that you don't see. You're, you're Together, you're both better than, uh, than, than oh, separately. Well, I mean, it's just, you, you play off each other. But go ahead and lead, it, let Malcolm the, lead into this yeah, story the, you're about to tell. The funny part about <laughs> the chemistry is, it just kind of happened. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Velma Jones was working with Bob Harmon, and she came in, she says, hey, I'm bringing this guy in that I want you to uh, to see if you can work with. And I'm like, well, you know, that's that's fine. I mean, I've had some great partners over the years, the, the Rich Blums, the Charlie Mattoses, you know, as, as we go through. Um, and, you know, this guy shows up, and, and, and literally, I mean, he's all excited, and I'm going, hey, it's okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, no, I'm scared to death. I wasn't excited. It was <laughs> well, difference there. Well, but, uh, yeah, I mean, when, the, the first time I'm calling him on the radio, I'm not getting an answer, and I'm going, talk to me, talk to me. Well, I find out later. I didn't know how to work the radio. Literally, the headsets mm -hmm. that we had were a little bit different than anything he'd ever seen. It just kind of fell into place, and weird things happened because we were able to play off each other. But... Uh, some of the greatest stories uh, that, that I, and, and one day we'll write this book, but I know what Larry's favorite <laughs> is. We, uh, we're in Memphis, Tennessee at, uh, at, a, at what was then a bush race. And this place, race day, is packed. Now, from Memphis, that's probably 28, 30,000 people. But I mean, it's packed, it's standing room only. And uh, we're trying to, uh, we're trying to get some time kill before we've got to do all the pre-race stuff. And uh, among the other things that you've done in your past, you're an old Shriner clown, too. Set My nose this, is still red. I don't know. <laughs> set this up for you. So Malcolm's got four or five people that he's picked out of the crowd. He's got them down front to where everybody can see them. And he's talking to them. And one of them is this little kid. And, and Tommy, I think, was his name. And he's maybe five or six. And Tommy will not talk to Malcolm. And I am in the tower just in stitches because I've never met anybody who won't talk to this guy. Take it from here. And this is on the live microphone. Oh yeah. With the uh, TV joined in with us too, they were doing some <laughs> shots on it. And this little boy, Tommy, I says, uh, well, it was close to Mother's Day and we were doing That's interviews right. for the kids. We were saying happy, all the kids were saying happy Mother's Day, love you mom, what have you. He said, I can't say anything. And I said, how come you can't say anything? He said, mama said she'd whip my butt. <laughs> well, I turned him around away from the crowd. Now you can hear a pin drop in the crowd right yeah. now. It's, it's that way. And I asked him, I said, well, what is it you're not supposed to say? He said, I can tell you now. I said, sure. He said, mommy's with her boyfriend and daddy don't know it. <laughs> 35,000 people were laughing other than the one, two yeah. people sitting up in the there corner. At least two people who were laughing. People. Well, the worst part was all of a sudden you see these two people pop up and start down the grandstand. And the whole crowd starts looking at them. You remember this? Oh, this Mama awesome. comes over, snatches Tommy up. Malcolm's eyes are about this big, and I'm just watching. And the entire crowd turned on him. You remember <laughs> oh, that? They, I thought they were going to throw stuff oh. at him. It was bad. <laughs> Well, Malcolm, that was one of my favorite things you used to do at the fairgrounds. You'd go into the stands during the lulls in between races, uh, cautions, whatever, and do these impromptu fans in the stands interviews, just pe people at it random. Hi, how you doing? Where are you from? You enjoying the race? And I thought, this guy's playing with dynamite. <laughs> He's walking up to these race fans at random and poking a live microphone in front of them and letting them talk. Oh. <laughs> that leads us to the last story of this segment. <laughs> so we come to Nashville Super Speedway. And uh, we've got a pretty good crowd here, and we're trying to kill some time. No, we're Malcolm, big time now. We're at the oh, Super Speedway. Yeah. You know, we're, we're big time. Malcolm's down through the stands, and he decides we're going to do the husband calling mm -hmm. contest. Mm -hmm. And what happened? <laughs> Which right now is banned from any NASCAR track. I'll tell you that up front. <laughs> well, we didn't know it, but all the people that own Nashville Super Speedway were Dennis McLean, the president and CEO. They were all there. And so the premise of this joke is that you're, you're a farmer your farmer's wife, the farmer's out doing what he's doing. You've got supper ready. Mm -hmm. First of all, the air conditioner's messed up in the house. You've been slaving all day over a stove. Out in the field, he's in his air-conditioned tractor reading a magazine. Mm -hmm. And what I have the fans to do is say, okay, it's supper time. you got to call your husband home and you're mad at him. Mm -hmm. So I never 
folks, never hand your microphone to somebody. Rule one. So I hand a microphone, this lady says, honey, come home, supper's ready. Well, that was okay, that was really good. <laughs> the next one, honey, I'm mad at you, come home. The third one, who had <laughs> tattoos everywhere, <laughs> leather, and had had a little liquid. <laughs> yes. She gets on the microphone, and I know this is a family show, and so I'll kind of clean it up a little. You got your beeps ready? Yeah. I, she says, you, fill yeah. in the blank, get your, fill in the blank, back here because I'm going to fill in the blank. <laughs> the crowd loved it, and you take it from there. So Before you do that, I'm, on pro I'm the only NASCAR announcer ever on probation. But go ahead. How did Dennis McGlynn, the owner, take it? <laughs> well, I'll put it to you like this. About the third bleep, I start getting... My phone starts to ring, and I pick it up. I say hello, and it's uh, it's Cliff Hawks, who's the vice president and general manager. And I will never forget. All he said was, uh, mm. "We're never ever doing that one again, <laughs> are we?" <laughs> no, sir, boss. It's done. That's <laughs> thank you. Cliff was Cliff. a little uneasy anyway, yeah. but I figure anybody that turned Malcolm loose in a racing grandstands with a live microphone deserved whatever they get. Well. I, I have no sympathy for them. <laughs> oh boy. We got some more to tell you. We got some more <laughs> questions for Malcolm. You know, uh, you've worked a lot of places. Worked at Highland Rim too. Sure did for a lot of time. Still working there, son. Yep, yeah. Great, great relationship. What a great historic racetrack. And speaking of Highland Rim, they're back in business. The first part of uh, of April. Start practice the last of March. Got a media day, and then it's time to go racing. That's Highland Rim Speedway up I-65 from Nashville down I-65 of you're in Kentucky. Absolutely. Just remember, you got to get to the Bethel Road exit. We'll have more with Larry Woody and Malcolm West coming up next here on Pit Pass. Today's show is brought to you by locally owned and operated Highland Rim Speedway. Highland Rim Speedway is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year with great short track door-to-door -door stop car racing in a safe, family-friendly atmosphere. Visit their website at highlandrim.com. Well, welcome back everybody to Pit Pass. Joe Williams, Larry Woody, and my man, Malcolm West, we, your voice has been heard literally at racetracks across the country. Have you ever sat down and tried to figure out, I did the other day, have you ever sat down and tried to figure out how many people you've actually talked to? Talk to? It's amazing, and I've thought about that, and, and what is amazing is when you really appreciate when you go somewhere and you're standing in line at a grocery store or something like that, and somebody will come say, Talk again. Yeah. Yes, how you doing? You're, you know, I'm at that level. You know, a lot of people know me, but you're, I know you from somewhere. Yeah. And, and that's pretty good. That's pretty cool. And I've had a lot of fun doing that. So. Malcolm, as you're coming along and your, your uh, career is progressing, was there anybody that kind of, besides Joe Williams, that you kind of patterned your, your announcing style or, or tried to learn from in the, in the big leagues, somewhere like a Barney Hall or a Darrell Walter or something like that? And anybody that that really stood out and you said, I'd kind of like to be like that guy. Helen Keller. She was real quiet. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Actually, it was uh, uh, Hugh Sweat. He was a former mayor of Central City and he was the announcer at the little dirt track that yeah. Clarence Brewer Sr. owned. Yeah. And he was, he was before his time. He would entertain crowds. In fact, one afternoon we were having time trials. It was close to Derby. The Goodyear blimp was on its way to the Derby. And he worked that. They're coming up. So ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, coming off of turn number four is a good year blimp, Columbia, visiting to Central City Racetrack here today. Give him a big round of applause. What an amazing way to just jump into a story. But Hugh Sweat, he, he was the one that I patterned after. And, and Malcolm, I think in your, your style and technique reflects this. In those days, and to an extent nowadays, an announcer was sort of an entertainer too. You just didn't inform the crowd what the running order is on the track. You, you sort of entertained, and like you said, on some of those tracks, you had to fill in the, the empty spaces too during uh, you know, uh, cautions, lulls, and action, that kind of thing. You're part announcer, part entertainer, weren't you? Had to be, and we had one one time where we gave away, there was a little airplane, a local radio station was doing a promo, and a, they were going to throw, it sounded fun, they were going to throw dollar bills out on the racetrack. This was at Barron County Speedway in Glasgow, Kentucky. Well, they forgot to figure in that the wind was blowing. And so they opened up the gate where the fans <laughs> go out on the racetrack, and all the dollar bills came out of the plane, and it, the wind caught them, and they started going. Well, across the, the back straightaway is a farm with bulls. Oh, no. In a fence. The fans were over there getting the dollar bills. The bulls were chasing the fans. One bull got, one fan got whatever bulls do to him. We knew this was not going to turn out well. Yeah. <laughs> this didn't work real well, but that one guy that got gored, he didn't sue the racetrack. He got 15 bucks. He was happy. Hmm. 
and you thought WKRP <laughs> throwing throwing uh, turkeys at the yes. helicopter was bad <laughs> to the bulls. Uh, What's the craziest thing you've ever done? Craziest thing I ever done? Probably when you and I, and this is how we kind of got our job with Nashville Super Speedway in Memphis, when we had to actually, uh, actually entertain the crowd for eight straight hours. Oh, that rain delay in the truck race, Larry. You yeah. you, you you sat through rain that. Rain delays. Yeah. We come with all kinds of contests. Your wife was very helpful on that. We had an ice cream eating contest. And remember, the stage is wet. We gave That's all these right. folks, and the folks, again, have had some other liquid other than yeah. the rain. And they're on the stage, and whoever gets their ice cream done. But we set the ice cream on the edge of the, the stage and had to go get the ice cream, eat it, finish it, whoever won. With their hands behind their back and on their knees. Yes, and so here they go. And this one guy gets it, and he slides, and the, the stage is very wet. He falls off the edge of the stage, has a laceration on his knee very deep from a nail sticking up out of the stage. He is bleeding profusely, still eating his ice cream. <laughs> and won. And won the contest. And he won. was happy. He's tickled death. Other than that, happy. Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like to play? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, some of the stuff, uh, and uh, the other thing Malcolm has always been good at is I started to say lying to the crowd. That's not, that's not a good one. Um, creating uh, creating uh, false generating oh, hey. interest yeah generating, generating interest by lying on what's yeah. going on you know the 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 uh, the camera in the, in the scoring pylon for example oh you know ABC is going yeah. live right now yeah. they're going to test this to see if it works embellishing is the word you're thank you for. that's yeah. the, see Larry's Larry's a writer and a wordsmith <laughs> and I'm not I had some embellishment last night it was really good well it's uh, <laughs> the uh, one of the best ones Larry, got to tell this one. Just Sorry. got to. So he builds up this big thing one afternoon because we are, uh, we're in a rain delay or something. And, and the big Dale Earnhardt movie in Nashville. Dale Earnhardt was still alive at the time. Obviously, there have been several Earnhardt movies since then. But I get on the stage and I pick out five fans and I'm saying that, you know, here's the key. We're going to do this movie and I, everybody acts out a part of Dale Earnhardt Sr.'s life. Well, Larry Woody thought that it was we were really going to have a movie and he hadn't heard anything about it. He was mad at Velma, the operator, because they haven't contacted him about doing a story on the Earnhardt movie. He calls DEI, calls everyone. I thought if Malcolm West said it, it exactly. had to be true. Well, so. but Larry, that's the, beauty, that's the beauty of what he did or what he does, and that is, you know, never mess, true here, never mess with the man with the microphone. Yeah, yeah. No, he fooled me. I mean, he was so sincere about it, and he's talking about this movie that's going to be produced here, and we need some, some people to, to act, you know, some extras and that kind of thing, and you like to audition, and we need to get it moving along because the producers are going to be in town. I mean, he, he built it up, oh, yeah. and, and he fooled the old sports writer. To, well, to make you feel better, you're not the only one he got. <laughs> there were others. Yeah. But and there was eventually a Dale Earnhardt movie. movie. Malcolm was just a little ahead of his time. <laughs> as, my, as, well, my, as my friend to, who used to write for USA Today once said, he'd, he wrote a, a story many years ago and referred to the late uh, Bill France Sr., who hadn't, who was still alive at the yeah. time, and USA Today ran a correction. We asked the guy about it, Jay Potter, and he said, well, when Mr. France does die, we can say we had it first. <laughs> so, so that's kind of like Malcolm with the Earnhardt movie. He, well, so Joe, got me. Joe paid me back because my hero was Buddy Baker, and he was in the grandstand at the fairgrounds, and, and Buddy comes in, and they had this set up, and I was working the ambulance service, and they, Mr. Baker says, what do you do for your living, young man? I said, I drive an ambulance. He said, I hate ambulance drivers, and I just melted. I said, how come? He said, well, one time, of course, he's about seven foot tall, as you know, <laughs> and they had him in back one of those hearse-type ambulances. He had got hurt at a dirt track, and the door flew open, and he comes out strapped to the gurney, rolls across the racetrack, turns upside down in a mud hole, and he says, that's why I hate ambulance drivers. With cars still coming His on the racetrack. Race race track, so. yeah. I've heard Buddy tell that story many times. He said, uh, I wasn't injured in the, in the crash, but the ambulance ride almost killed me. <laughs> That's <So>. right. <laughs> you, got, you got a million of those, haven't you? Oh, gosh, you? I do. And the fans have been so good to me and, and been so fun. I, we've had T-shirt contests. We've had people on the, the stand who would, uh, on the stage, who for a new T-shirt would take their T-shirt off. It was supposed to be a male competition. Yeah. And there were several females who did that. That's the reason I'm still on probation as an NASCAR yeah. announcer. Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't that bad except for the one, well, this is a, a family, family show. show. Thank yeah. you. Um, did we, she win? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, she did. She won two or three, actually. <laughs> was, uh. The other thing you've got to understand about this guy, a little background on Malcolm, you've heard me tell this story. You've worked for a congressman. Yes. You've been elected to political office. You've yeah. been a commissioner, a county clerk. You are a certified licensed EMT. Correct. Uh, and probably saved my life one afternoon mm -hmm. when I went tumbling. Uh, you've worked for 
you, you've had your own limousine service. I still do. We've opened it back. You've opened if it you back need up. a limo, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's, <laughs> um, you've been involved in a multitude of things. And PR director, of course. Yeah. PR, how, public how, relations. How do you tie all that together? Well, it's fun because I go out and do some motivational speaking to kids, and I always say it's not where you start, it's where you finish. Right. And I've had a lot of fun. Now, either I've been really good at what I do, or I can't keep a job. <laughs> well, I've always looked that way. But Keep looking until you find something. That's you can right. Do. But I've had a lot of fun. And so I've, I've made all my goals that I wanted to be firefighter, broadcaster, politician. I've did it all. And everything I do from this point is just fun. Malcolm, I think listeners around here, particularly in the Nashville, Middle Tennessee area, would be interested in an update on, on Bruco and what you what the company is up to because, as we know, Gary Baker and Mike Kerr bought Bruco Motorsports, moved it to Nashville, and it didn't work out. You know, tried to run a, a nationwide schedule and suspended operations last year. So uh, Baker Curb Racing is temporarily suspended, but Bruco as a company still is going on in Kentucky and you still work for them. What, what are some of the things you do and, and still racing related? Sure, partners? sure. Do a lot of show cars. Uh, we have some great, uh, great uh, major name brand uh, clients that we take out. We take our show car if we do setups. Uh, anything to do with racing, we're doing it. It's really a thriving business and they do all kinds of public relations and, and marketing it's, and it's fun. I have a fun job. But don't actually feel the race car. No, no, speak. just show cars. You know, that show car won't run over anybody. It won't, it won't tear up on the wall you know, or anything like that. And so, well, I say it won't run over anybody. There's this one time in Mexico. <laughs> no, anyway. But it, it's just a lot of fun. It still has that connections of racing. Clarence Bird, Todd Wilkerson, all these folks, uh, Shane Kennedy uh, put together a great marketing company and they, they're very well here in Nashville, there's a lot of things for a lot of companies. Any in Nashville. chance they might get a car on the track at some point, or is that sort of thing that the, the Brewer family is just well? Let's well, you mentioned the family. Part of the family wants yeah. to, and the other family who, who takes care of the purse string says no. Yeah. So we'll leave it at that. They enjoyed all of that they could stand. Exactly. They, they were a very successful racing team back at, in those days. Mm -hmm. you know, so like several wins, yeah. uh, came close, won second a championship one year. Fielded uh, yeah. one time we're fielding three teams, and yeah. so it's, it was Motorsports a great deal. was a good team, mm -hmm. great team, and probably would have continued under Baker Curb had not. The economy. That one, well, that one quick signature yes. that took, because yeah. they had they had the Red Man sponsorship yes. at the yes. time, mm -hmm. um, which, had a is, which is a tobacco product, which is, tobacco yeah, fortunately, I guess band. we can say that. Right. But, the, the, but one the, stroke of the pen, and that was over. But the problem is, uh, Gary Baker, who's one of the best marketing people in, in the country, hasn't been able to get a sponsor, Malcolm, and I think that speaks, tells, you, tells us a lot about maybe the state of the sport, particularly a sport that lives and dies with corporate sponsorships. It's kind of a rough time right now. And the good news is it's getting better, yeah. but it's still still pretty bad. Now, really one is. of the sponsors that you guys had at Bruco for a long while was the United States Postal Service, just like Lance Armstrong. Should we go back? Can, can, can we go back and, and have some oil samples or something to look at? <laughs> you know, I thought about that, and uh, there's several jokes I could go different ways, but again, that's the 9 o'clock Tonight Show. But it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing because even when the Earnhardt folks can't get sponsorships, and Jack, you know, Roush Fenway and all these folks can't get sponsorships, so it's, it's pretty tough. But we were very excited that we were launching pay for Casey Atwood and Jamie McMurray and David Green and many, many others who brought us a lot of wins, still have a lot of great fans for get a lot of fan mail still. We get fan mail at the racetrack, at the race shop still. Yeah. still. still. And one thing, kind of an aside, you did some racing announcing along the way that yeah, we exactly. mentioned. Are bills. you going to do any more? Yes, I am. Uh, I'll continue with Highland Rim. Uh, got some other avenues that uh, Joe and I are working on to do some things, but I love being, by, you know, I don't care. I could be sitting and doing Daytona, and I'm just as happy doing Highland Rim or Windy Hollow or Kentucky yeah. Motor Speedway up in my home area. I just love announcing. In some ways, those little tracks are more fun, more entertaining for somebody like you that's part entertainer and part announcer. Yeah, free hot dogs. You, you, may, have, you may have more fun at those little tracks than, than at a big track where everything is structured and set. Pretty stressful and, at the big tracks, as Joe yeah, will tell you. Yeah. It, it, it starts to be a timing issue. In other words, at Daytona, they wouldn't turn Malcolm loose in the grandstand yeah, to, to, to interview fans in the stands with a loud Although microphone. I'd love to do it. I'd like to try it one it time to show how we do time. it. Yeah. The, the, the tough part for him, and, I, and we'll, we'll wrap it up here, but the, uh, the, the classic to me, and we talked about it earlier, was when we had Nashville and, and Memphis, we kind of swapped up so we both could do either. And at Memphis, Malcolm was on stage, and I stayed in the tower, and we swapped up at Nashville. And, and one year we get to Memphis and it rains us out. And it's, it's rained us out like six straight races. We race the next day. You just start preparing for it, taking extra flows. Long story short, he's got everything done. He's ready. He's just watching the NASCAR guy to give him the signal because they literally are down to the second on their minute by minutes. And uh, they come in and go, stop everything. It's rained out in New Hampshire. We're taking this race from TNT to NBC. And I told him, I said, hey, buddy, you're about to be on national TV. 
NBC. This is big time. And he went fantastic. I said, all they got to, they said, all they got to do is switch the bird over, ready to go. He said, how long will it take? And I turned around and said, how long does it take to switch the bird? And the guy goes, 18 minutes. <laughs> I radioed down. I said, I got good news and bad news. <laughs> Remember this? He said, what's that? I said, good news, you're on national TV. Uh-huh. I said, the bad news is it's 18 minutes away. <laughs> <laughs> Start talking. <laughs> and he, very quickly, I know we're against time here, but right by the first race at Memphis, the, mic, the, the cordless mm -hmm. mics, can I tell this? Oh. I mean, the cordless mics messed up. We're on live television. The minister is getting ready to do the prayer, and he can't do it because there's no microphone. Joe says, go with me. The minister bows his head, and Joe's doing the prayer. <laughs> and the minister just, <laughs> and Joe's doing a prayer in the tower. The minister's lip syncing. He's yeah. lip syncing, yeah. I, I didn't think about that. Yeah. Millie Vanilli made all over yeah. again there with the preacher. I didn't There's know another that. great Joe Williams yeah. national anthem story we'll see for another segment yeah. for some point. <laughs> There are stories. <laughs> Many of them. Yeah. We don't have enough time to get through all of them. Thank you for coming in. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me in. Yeah. Appreciate so, you guys. Appreciate your friendship. Appreciate being here. So Malcolm West, uh, the voice of racing from across, uh, definitely across Kentucky, Tennessee, the southeast. And, and Larry, he's, <clears throat> Malcolm's not quite reached the announcing equivalent of Larry Woody as a writer. <clears throat> But he's getting close on There's it. No, nobody does it better. He's Thank nobody does it better. Tell you what, uh, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll wrap all this up. And then we may well go down to the batter's box, down on Hermitage Avenue. The batter's box now serving breakfast. So it's not just great lunch and dinner. You can even get breakfast. That's at the batter's box, 43 Hermitage Avenue. We'll be back to wrap up Pit Pass coming up after this. Jeff Meeks and Chris Austin invite you to watch your favorite sports event at the batter's box at 43 Hermitage Avenue in Nashville, Tennessee. The Batter's Box offers shuttle service to all Titans home games. It's a great place for friends to gather for the game and after the game. So check out the Batter's Box Bar and Grill, and thanks again for sponsoring the show. Welcome back, everybody, to Pit Pass. I'm Joe Williams, along with Larry Woody. Special thanks to Malcolm West for coming in. Larry, you get Malcolm in here. We didn't touch the number of stories that... that could be told. Scratch the surface. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like you. If I can ever get you talking <laughs> about some of the stuff, yeah. we need to just do a Larry Woody segment well, later. We well, might do a book someday. We'll get Malcolm in and oh. then we'll get the lawyers. We'll have to get yeah. some oh, lawyers, we'll have to have lawyers. you know, to proofread it. We had a lot of fun. <laughs> we said on the open, it's, it's kind of a roller coaster and uh, it truly has been mm -hmm. a, a roller coaster week. Earlier this week, uh, we found that uh, our old friend Joe Carver Sr. had passed away in North Carolina. Joe was a a Nashville native, went to East High School, uh, traveled the world with the U.S. Navy and came back and went to work for Bill Donahoe and became one of the great PR directors uh, that, uh, that have ever graced a racetrack. <coughs> Among the other things he'd done, he left here, went to Langley, Virginia and got Langley Speedway back up and running, left there in uh, 83 to come home and brought with him the late model stock cars to Nashville and did his best, Larry, to um, buffer the with with good management and good ideas the uh, the horribleness that was Warner Hodgson mm -hmm. and, and his effect on this place and then uh, after that went to work for Daryl and, and Daryl Waltrip who uh, he had kind of taken under his wings years before yeah. and uh, spent the last few years as a uh, show car manager program manager for JKS Incorporated and they're doing 30 or 40 uh, show cars across the country. Larry, uh, this is uh, this is one of those folks that while the entire world may not understand what Joe Carver did for racing not only here but but across the southeast. Um, he, he's one of those folks that was so instrumental but may never really have his name in a record book or an encyclopedia. Somewhere. Well, first of all, Joe, Joe, Joe Carver, the Joe Carvers of the world made NASCAR. Yeah. You know, Joe, not individually our Joe Carver, but Joe and a relatively handful of people like him built NASCAR because they, they generated PR for the sport. They uh, understood the, the importance of the, the, the media and the press. They worked to, as a liaison between the media and the press to get NASCAR publicity back in the old days when the media kind of turned its nose up. So again, without the Joe Carvers of his era, I don't think we'd have a NASCAR today. And when I got your email about Joe's death the other day, Joe just brought back a flood of memories because, as I told you then, Joe Carver was my mentor when I got stuck on the racing beat at the Tennessee.
Tennessee, and I told Bill, I said, I, I, he said, go out and interview a race driver. I said, Bill, I don't even know where the track is. He said, look up Joe Carver. He'll take <laughs> care of you. And yeah. I did, and Joe took care of me for many years after that. He helped me through the sport. He introduced me to drivers. He explained which direction the cars were running on the track. And I would have been lost if it weren't for Carver. And he did that, uh, Joe, as you know, for so many young people coming up through the ranks, he would take them under, under his wing and he'd guide them through and he's patient and his understanding, had a great sense of humor. And it's people like that, Joe, and our, like our friend Malcolm West, that's what made uh, racing so much fun back then. They were good people and they were fun to work with. And Joe made the Nashville media want to come out and cover racing. You know, people that might not come out otherwise and cover it, Joe would call them, say, hey, we've got a great story out here. we got some guy from, from North Carolina named Dale Earnhardt. Come out, he'd make you a good interview. And Joe went out and just beat the, the streets, wore out shoe leather, selling racing for the fairgrounds. And again, people like him, without that, that great grassroots work <clears throat> that Joe was so instrumental in, I, I don't think NASCAR would have ever got off the ground, certainly back in those days. And, and I think that foundation accounts for how popular it is today. And unfortunately, I think NASCAR has got away from a lot of that and we don't have the Joe Carvers anymore and that's part of NASCAR's problems. But what a, what a great guy. You, uh, you, did an out, you wrote an outstanding piece for uh, Racing Today. Yeah. Larry's still writing for RacingToday.com. It's a good place. It's Racing, R-A-C-I-N-T-O-D-A-Y.com. Um, after, after we emailed back and forth, you wrote a fantastic piece. And I like the part that uh, the first race story you wrote Joe Carver practically dictated wrote it. To it. <laughs> dictated it. Because I'm serious, I, I'd never been to a track back then. The first race I saw was kind of like uh, Jerry Clower talking about the first football game he ever saw he played in. The first stock car race, the first race anything else I ever saw, I was covering, you know. Had, and Joe was at the, at the fairgrounds, you know, as you said, PR director, general, uh, general manager. He did everything for Bill Donahoe at those days. And Joe kind of, he, he introduced me to the drivers. He helped ask the questions that I didn't know to ask. And then when I sat in the press box typing my story, up, Joe would stand over my shoulder and kind of make suggestions <laughs> and uh, and that kind of thing. So basically, he wrote the first story that had my byline on it. It was actually written by, by Joe Carver. Joe was about six, probably six six. Always appeared to be larger than life. Was stark white headed yep. at probably thirty. Yep. Uh, big booming voice, mm -hmm. just just had this presence. Always laughing and joking. always a just, smile, yep. always laughing, yep. always had a story or a joke. Mm -hmm. He uh, when he came back to Nashville in 1984, Larry, the the track had struggled through some times of, of poor car counts, kind of familiar of what we've we've been through yep. in the last few years, yep. uh, declining attendance and all that, and he brought with him the late model stock car division. And I remember because he hired me at the end of 83 uh, to be the PR director. And there's another story there. But what I remember about it was he brought these cars in and there were people who looked at him and said, you're nuts, you'll fail, we will never build one of those. And his response was, if you want to race here, this is what you will build. And you see what, hap what that division did over the next four years, five yeah. years. Yeah, Joe was really good at, at, he knew the racing, he knew the sport, he understood what makes, what works and what doesn't. And he transferred the same, uh, that same talent to Langley, as you know, yeah. the, the track there. And that, that, he turned that into one of the premier tracks in the, in the Southeast, I guess the entire country. But everywhere you'd go, you'd hear people talking around the circuit about what a great job Joe Carver's doing at Langley. You know, he's revived that track, he's brought it back, successful, big crowds and so forth. So he, the same talents that made him so good here in Nashville worked there and of course, as you said, he, he served a stint as, uh, as Darrell Waltrip's, I, yeah. I guess he's sort of a PR person. Joe, Joe always laughed at I, I once asked Carver, I said, Joe, what exactly is your title with Darrell? And he said, servant. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well, if you remember, when, when Waltrip won the Daytona 500 finally, uh, Joe calls me and he says, look, Daryl's coming in at this time at the, at the airport. Mm. We're putting together, you know, mm. folks to, to come meet him. You need to be there. Yep. And I said, well, well, you know, I mean, that's I, sure. I mean, I'll be there, but I don't, I don't understand. He said, no, you need to be there. Mm. And I'm like, okay, why? He said, because I ask you. <laughs> and, I, you know, that was enough to go, hey, I'm there. What time? <laughs> um, and of course, the, the Joe you know. Carver, Darrell Waltrip connection relationship goes back to the early years because when Darrell came in from Owensboro, he had a lot of rough, rough edges, as you know. And, yeah. and if anybody ever needed some PR work, uh, buffing, yeah. 
Daryl Waltrip needed it, and Joe Carver was the guy who did a lot of that buffing and smoothed over some of the Daryl's rough edges. And I think Joe taught Daryl, as Joe Carver taught me a lot of lessons about journalism. I think Joe Carver taught Daryl Waltrip a lot of lessons about PR yeah. and and working with the media and being part of the media that we Daryl still uses today as a commentator on on Fox Sports. I think the Joe Carver influence lives on through Daryl Waltrip and through a lot of us, uh, and yeah. I know through a lot of us older. Racing oh, yeah. riders. Well, I was blessed to, to work with Joe Carver, Gary Baker, and Bob Harmon. Bob and Joe sometimes didn't get along real well, and, and I'm convinced Larry it's because they were so much alike. Yeah, they were, and and uh, and it was a it's a good relationship. Though it wasn't an adversarial, you know, if somebody bounced an idea off somebody, I don't know if that'll work or not. They could sit down and, and work it out without yeah. they didn't come to blows or anything. And same way with Daryl, you know, uh, Daryl could be difficult to work with, but Joe Carver was able to work with Daryl. And as I say, got him through some of these media mazes, and I think it he was instrumental in Daryl's, uh, particularly in the early career. Darrell was a fast learner, but Joe Carver was one of the guys that, that taught him some of those early lessons that, again, he still uses today, I think. And I, I would not be surprised if it wasn't Carver who prompted him to, to be a little more outspoken than everybody else mm -hmm. when Darrell started mm -hmm. the, the being outspoken. Joe understood the, the power of the press and that it didn't hurt to stir the pot a little if it would get some, some media attention. He understood that the sport lives or dies with press coverage. If you don't get it, nobody's going to come out to watch the races if they don't know they're there. If you got some loudmouth from Owensboro, Kentucky who's going to threatens to put Cuckoo Marlin over <laughs> over the <laughs> wall the next race, then people like Darrell, then people may come out to see if Darrell Waltrip's going to put Cuckoo Marlin over, over the, the wall fence, the next yeah. day. So, and Joe, again, there's nothing wrong with that. It, that was just the nature of the sport at the time you needed some stories to sell to the media, to sell to the public, to sell tickets. Yeah. And Joe Carver did it better than anybody, as well as anybody I've ever known. Harmon was close, I guess. Humpy Wheeler was up there in that category. But you've got to put Joe Carver somewhere in that top four or five of great racing promoters in that era. And I think one of the guys who will uh, take some uh, some cues from him will be uh, Buddy Williams and the guys up at, uh, up at Highland Rim. And uh, Buddy probably does a couple of things. Uh, over at USA Motor and Machine, just well, I know he built, but when 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 Carver came in and started making some rules changes, Buddy came in and said, "Look, we're at USA Motor and Machine. We do this, we do this, we do that," and uh, he kind of bought into it and went, "We can make those changes and we can do it inexpensively," and I think they all worked together some then. Uh, Carver, um, if if there is a, if if there's a regret. It, it's funny that this this came up this week because it was a regret. I was making notes last week, Larry, about people I wanted to get on as guests and maybe bringing them in uh, through technology, et cetera. And he was like number two, number three on that yeah. list. And uh, I did great to have him. I didn't make the phone call in time. It's uh, like one of our guests a while back, Russ Thompson. Joe Carver knows uh, he, w he he knows about the history of the sport because he was there, yeah. and so nobody would be better. And that's one of the regrets. Obviously, you know, we, uh, you you think about old friends. As I say, when you I got your email about Joe, that they just brought a, a flood of emotions and sat down thinking about the old days and the, the fun people. And again, like like our buddy Malcolm West, you know, that's what made racing so much fun. It wasn't just the cars running in circles on the racetrack. And frankly, I'm still not into that all that much. It's the, the people and the characters that you meet around racing that makes it so intriguing and, and in the old days was so much fun to, to cover. I, I will tell quickly the, the story that hit me when I, when I got the news. In uh, 84, started in 1984 when he came back. I'm, I'm 21 years old. I don't, you know. Uh, but he hired me to do the, the media and the PR out at the fairgrounds and uh, I mean we're having cup races and all this. And probably three weeks before the first race on a Friday afternoon we have a conversation and he didn't seem unhappy didn't seem happy and as I'm leaving uh, his son Joe Carver Jr. there are three Joes there at the time which was a lot of fun comes up and says hey daddy told me to get your keys and I went what am I fired he said apparently well I spent the evening at uh, Jesse Nash's <laughs> shop going nuts he fires me on Friday I walk back in Monday morning I'm waiting on him when he gets there and I go in and explain to him he's made a huge mistake and that uh, he needs to change his mind. And I go, I mean, I'm 21 years old, figured got nothing to lose. And he sat there. It's the only time I knew him to sit and just listen. He sat for, listened for about 15 minutes. He said, son, you got more guts than I thought. Go back to work. <laughs> you won him over. Yeah, I mean, it was, but you know, that's, that's just kind of the way it was. He, he, was, uh, he was willing to listen. Yeah.
And can you imagine, Joe, I was thinking about this too. Bill Donahoe was one of my favorite people, but he was a cantankerous old guy, old, you know, old school, yeah. carried a pistol. You know, yeah. paid paid drivers with cash through the pay windows with his pistol lying beside the, yeah. the stack of cash. He was not the easiest person to work with, and Joe Carver was able to work with Bill Donahoe. So and that succeed tells, and, and succeed, do it do it well. It, you know, he could he could work with anybody from Hope Hines down at Channel Five doing the, some of those early racing shows to cantankerous old Bill Donahoe. He just had that personality where everybody liked. Joe Carver, except for you briefly when he fi when they fired you, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but no, I'm serious. 48 it, hours, it, yeah. Yeah, but I, I just, as you talk to people in those days and even to today, you just don't run across anybody who says, Joe Carver, no, I never cared for that guy. Everybody liked yeah. Carver. That was just one of those qualities that uh, you, you can't learn it or be trained for it. You're born with it. and. Uh, and that's what made Joe so good at his job. He just got along with everybody. He's a great liaison. If there's a problem, you know, from the fairgrounds to Daryl Waltrip, you know, peeving some media person, uh, Joe Carver is always there to, to smooth things over and, uh, yeah. and, and keep the, keep the, the machine well oiled. He was, he was as good as there's ever been. Joe leaves behind uh, his wife of over 30 years, Diana, his son Sam, Joe Jr., several other children. Um, we do not at this point have details on when uh, all the services will be. And of course, as, as this is posted, it could be within a day or two. Uh, let us just say, no matter when the services are, that Joe Carver Sr. will be missed greatly and remembered more than fondly by racing communities across this country. That's gonna do it this week for Pit Pass. Larry? Quick show. Been a fun. En enjoyable show. Some great, great old memories of, with Malcolm Fun memories and some maybe some uh, Mullen Collin, Mullen Collin, Collin memories about our buddy Joe Carver, but bittersweet. But they're good ones. All good. Yeah. They're all good ones. We thank you for joining us this week. We'll see you next time on Pit Pass. <laughs>